Hey, if this is your first time here, we've never met. My name is Chris, and I'm the associate pastor here. I am so glad to be here with y'all this morning. Uh, tell you a little something about me when I was younger. When I was a child, I did not like to eat broccoli. Now, parents in the room, I know that really doesn't shock any of you here because I think the vast majority of young children don't like broccoli. And I don't think that's by accident. I think that's something that God actually like designs and puts into children so that they don't grow too big and strong and like overthrow the parental jurisdiction of the house. Because I think children all secretly are trying to take over the world, whether we realize it or not. So parents, if your kids eat broccoli, watch your back. That's all I'm saying. But I did not like broccoli as a kid. And I tried. I really did. I mean, I tried it every single way I possibly could. I poured ranch on it. I poured cheese on it. I boiled it. I did whatever I could, but nothing changed it for me. Every time I looked at broccoli, I looked at it like it was an abomination. It was just some bitter food that served to torment me in my youthful days. And I kept this viewpoint about broccoli all the way until I was a senior in college. When I was a senior in college, my friends and I decided that we were going to start dieting, and so one of the foods that we decided to bring back into our life was broccoli. Now, the reason is we knew broccoli had a couple of really good attributes, right? We knew that it was low in calorie and nutrient dense, all the stuff people say to make you eat it, and so we were like, all right, well, it's got to serve some kind of purpose for us, but we decided that we would at least try things a little differently, and so what we did was we decided to approach it differently. We seasoned it with salt and garlic and pepper, and we roasted it in the oven. And bingo, right? All of a sudden, this horrible food gave way to glorious flavor. And now, I love broccoli. It's one of my favorite foods. And so this food that I spent years hating is now something that actually brings me joy and serves a great purpose for me. Well, we're continuing in our series, Save the Date, where we've been taking the past few weeks to look at what God's Word has to say about marriage. Now, this week in particular is going to look a little different, because as we walk through a series on marriage, we believe that it's also equally important for us to talk about what God's Word says about being single. And so that's what I want to do with you this morning. And here's why I think this is such an important topic for us to talk about. Because I think whether you're married or single in this room, the vast majority of us tend to look at singleness kind of like I did when I, at broccoli when I was a kid, right? We look at singleness like it's this bitter thing that serves no purpose in our life whatsoever. But I don't think singleness has to be that for you. In fact, I believe that if you can change the way you approach singleness, it can actually be something that brings joy into your life and serves a great purpose for you and for the kingdom of God. So, if you have your Bibles or Bible apps this morning, you can open those up to 1 Corinthians 7, and that's where we're going to be camping out for most of the day. Now, if you're not familiar with the book of 1 Corinthians, it's one of the letters that Paul wrote in the New Testament, and it's one of two letters that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth that we have in our Bible. And what we know about the church in Corinth is that Paul was very familiar with them. He knew the people, he knew the church, and he knew the issues that they faced because of not only context of knowing them, but letters that they wrote to Paul. And so he wrote the book of 1 Corinthians as a way to try and address and correct some of these issues. And a few of the things included in this topics were marriage and singleness. And who better to talk about marriage than Paul, right? Because he's one of those people, if you're familiar with Paul, you may know that a vast majority of the most popular teachings on marriage and even some of the most controversial ones on teachings of marriage come from Paul in the Bible, and so Paul actually held marriage in very, very high regard. And we know this because in Ephesians 5, when Paul describes marriage, he uses a Greek word called mysterion, which translates to this idea of a highly important temple ritual. And so Paul held marriage with high esteem. Now, if you know that about Paul, you would assume that as the Corinthians write to Paul, asking him to help them understand how to honor God in the context of marriage and live out their faith in this way, that Paul, because he reveres marriage in this way, would then go on to write this chapter that's this beautiful story of how they can honor God within this. But I want you to look at what Paul writes in verses six through eight. Paul says, I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all of you were as I am. But each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now, to the unmarried and the widows, I say it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. 
Now, these verses at first glance seem like a pretty harsh departure from the way Paul usually talks about marriage. But you need to understand the context from which Paul writes this. In Corinth at the time, because of the immense sexual immorality that was prevalent all throughout the culture of Corinth, the church in Corinth started to develop this belief that the best and only way to fight against sexual immorality was to be celibate or to abstain from sex. And this did not apply just to single people. This belief started to spread to marriages and the church in Corinth actually began instructing married couples to separate and remain celibate so that they wouldn't be tempted. And so Paul, in the very beginning uh, verses of this chapter, actually writes to defend marriage as a beautiful gift from God. He talks about how it is something given by God, and he instructs the Corinthians not to discourage sex in the context of marriage. And he even goes on to give some practical advice on what sex in marriage should look like. And if you were here last week, you know that Nathan actually looked at some of the verses from 1 Corinthians 7. And if you didn't catch that sermon, I would encourage you, go back and watch it, and it's got some great stuff in there for you to learn. But as Paul gets to verses 6 through 8, he has been defending marriage, right? He says, look, marriage is a beautiful gift from God. So should people get married? Yeah, absolutely. There's nothing wrong with that. Should married people have sex? Is sex good in the context of marriage? Yes. But Paul is quick to put a caveat onto this. In verse 8, Paul says it is good that unmarried people stay single. Now, the word that Paul uses for good here is a Greek word called kalos. And what kalos best translates to is something that is beautiful and honorable. And so as Paul talks about singleness here, he says that singleness, even when compared to marriage, is a beautiful an honorable thing. So why would Paul feel the need to make that distinction about singleness? Well, before becoming a follower of Christ, Paul was a Pharisee. These were the religious leaders of Judaism. And so Paul, he was deeply devoted to Judaism and deeply committed to the laws of God. And you may not know this, but in the time that Paul was a Pharisee, there was a belief in Judaism that to remain unmarried was actually a sin. And they based this law on Genesis 2.18, which said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now, this verse comes in context of the creation story found in Genesis, right? It's explaining how we got Adam and then we got Eve. But what was meant to be an explanation for the creation of women and where marriage came from became Judaism's command for marriage. And so it was actually a belief and a law at the time that if you were a man, by the time you were 20, if you were still unmarried at the age of 20, you were considered to be excluded from heaven and no longer a man in the eyes of society. Marriage was not a goal to strive for. It was a standard to be met. And I wonder how many of you have ever felt that way about marriage as well. Maybe it was something that was pressured on you by your parents growing up. Maybe it's something you feel as a result of a society that preaches independence but strives for the fairy tale ending. Or maybe it's a belief that was instilled upon you early in the church. Whatever the case, this verse right here has been the cause of a lot of grief. Because if you look at this verse and you misinterpret it, it lends to the idea that God has this perfectly designed spouse for you. Anybody ever heard that before? Yeah. And so the problem with this is, is what happens is churches and leaders and other Christians will then tell you, well, man, if you just, if you just pray harder, right, if, if you're just patient in this season, right, if you're just obedient to God, well, then God will give you a spouse, but the reality is, Scripture doesn't teach that at all. Proverbs 18.22 says, He who finds a wife finds what's good and receives favor from the Lord. Now, note the way that Solomon writes this. Solomon doesn't say, He who receives a wife. Solomon doesn't say, He who finds his wife. Solomon says, He who finds a wife 
finds a good thing. Men in the room, Solomon's letting you know, if you find a lady who loves Jesus and is willing to put up with you for the rest of your life, you're a lucky man. Solomon's point is that marriage, it's not an absolute. It's not a guarantee. And so even when he talks about the favor of God, this is not a result of obedience, but it is the blessing of God on marriage. That marriage, it is God-ordained, it is a beautiful gift, but it is not the end-all, be-all goal of your life. And so the point that Paul is making as he talks about singleness here is he's saying, look, singleness, it's not some curse. It's not some state of disobedience. Singleness is not this season you're in where you wait until what God has for you for the rest of your life. Having come from a culture that viewed singleness so negatively, Paul sets the record straight for singleness. He says singleness is good. And he doesn't say that waiting for marriage in the context of singleness is good. Paul says, look, if you remain single for the rest of your life, that's still good. That singleness is a beautiful and honorable thing in the same way that marriage is beautiful and honorable to God. And Paul even goes on to call singleness a gift. Look back at verse 7 with me. He says, but each of you has your own gift from God. One has this gift and another has that. Now, I want to be very clear. I do not want to gloss over the pain and the difficulty of being single at times. When I was 23 years old, for most of you that don't know my age, I know I look like I might be 23 now. I'm going to be 28 in a month. Five years ago, I left every one of my family and friends in Mississippi, and I moved to the state of Georgia by myself. And so when I first got there, it's just me and God. And there were plenty of days and plenty of weeks at the beginning of that process that were hard because I know what it looks like to be by yourself. And there are many days where that does not feel like a gift from God. I recognize that. But I think one of the main reasons that we don't often feel like singleness is a gift from God is we don't really understand what Paul means when he calls marriage and singleness gifts. See, the word that Paul uses to describe marriage and singleness here is not the typical word used in the Greek for gifts. As Paul describes marriage and singleness, he actually uses a word called charisma, which is where we get the word charisma from. And its basic definition in literal sense is a gift of grace or a grace favor. Now, what's interesting about the word charisma is that it is the exact same Greek word that Paul uses later in his book in 1 Corinthians 12 as he describes the gifts of the Spirit. And so what Paul is saying is that, yes, singleness and marriage are gifts, but they're not gifts in the traditional sense, right? They don't exist simply for enjoyment. But rather, these are gifts that actually help serve a purpose. Which, if we're being honest with ourselves, it's the best kind of gift anyway, right? Yet, you know, when I was younger at Christmas time, I would ask for the most impractical things, right? They were not things useful to me. I always wanted, you know, the next gaming console, whether that was, you know, the GameCube or the Xbox, or the Xbox 360 or the Xbox 7000, whatever we're on now. And, you know, I would ask for like cool sunglasses or yo yo's. Yes, don't judge me. But these are all things that were cool. They didn't serve a purpose for me. And I can remember when I got older, the gifts that I got started to get more practical. And I remember in particular one year where it was like really set in stone for me. Because there was a year where my grandmother did the most stereotypical thing on the face of this planet. I received socks and underwear for Christmas. And y'all, I have never been so excited in my life because I needed those. And I remember sitting there thinking, I was like, is this what maturity is? Like if I finally made it? But my favorite Christmas that I've ever experienced, that I can remember at least, was about five years ago, and, or almost six years ago now. But 
I remember my mom got me a bunch of cooking utensils for Christmas. And she got me a bunch of really nice chef's knives and cutting boards and different kitchen gadgets because I, in the process of moving and growing up, I got really into cooking. I love to cook and I like to cook all kinds of different things. And so for Christmas that year, that's what she got me. And I love those gifts because they were useful to me, right? If she had gotten me those when I was 16 years old, I would not have cared one bit because I didn't cook. She cooked. But when I was 24, and this was all I did, I loved those gifts because they actually served a real purpose for me. And Paul is saying that marriage and singleness, that's the kind of gift that singleness is. It is useful to us because it helps us fulfill our purpose. And our purpose is actually laid out by Paul later in one of his other books, Ephesians 2.10. He says that we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus, right? This is why we exist, to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. So the purpose on our lives is to fulfill the mission of sharing the gospel and making disciples. We are designed and created for good works in the kingdom of God. And so what we are called to is to grow in our relationship with God and to lead others to Jesus by sharing the grace and the truth of Jesus. And Paul says that the season that you find yourself in, married or single, that is a gifting appropriate for the time because you are now uniquely gifted in the moment God has placed you to fulfill your purpose. And it's in the fulfillment of our purpose that we find fulfillment in our lives. But the problem with this is, is we don't often see it that way. We think that satisfaction and fulfillment comes from the next thing, right? Am I single? All right, I gotta find a boyfriend or a girlfriend, right? Am I dating? I've gotta get engaged. Am I engaged? I've gotta get married. All right, we're married, now we've gotta get the house. All right, we got the house, now we gotta have the kids. And well, the kids, I mean, the kids have to have grandkids, and those grandkids, they've gotta have great grandkids, and it just goes on and on. We're building out this roadmap that we think leads to success, that we think leads to satisfaction and fulfillment in our lives, and Paul says you're doing it wrong. That if you look at marriage as this thing that's going to bring satisfaction and fulfillment to your life, he says, you've missed it, that it will fall flat. It will never work. Because marriage, it is a gifting, not the grand design for your life. Now, I love video games. I can play video games all day long if I really wanted to, and I don't really care what kind of video game it is as long as it's entertaining to me. But I will tell you in particular, I love fantasy video games. If it looks kind of like the Lord of the Rings, I'm in, right? And one of my favorite games ever is a game called Skyrim. And it's not a new game at all. It's been out for 13 years, but it is one of the most popular games ever created. And there's a reason for that. Skyrim is this game that is this big, vast, open world where you can do anything you want and be whoever you want. Sounds good, right? It's a game, though, that gets really easy to get lost in the content. Because in this world of vast open choices, there actually is a main storyline that you're trying to follow, in theory. And they've done research on this, that a person who is devoted to completing the main storyline of this game would take 35 hours to complete the main story. It's a lot. But as shocking as that is, there is an additional 200 hours of extra content in the form of what they call side quests. And these side quests, really easy to get lost in. Because don't get me wrong, right, they serve a purpose. Because you you complete these side quests in the game, you get money, you get cool things, you can buy more cool things, you level up, now you can fight bigger things, right? It all seems like it's good. But the problem is, is if you get caught up in this, what you're going to find out happens is you spend hours and hours and hours rescuing yet another weird artifact from yet another group of bandits. And what you'll find out is you've spent all this time completing all these side quests and you never touch the main story. We treat marriage and singleness the exact same way. We 
like to think that marriage is the main storyline of our life, that this is the storyline that we have to beat in order to fulfill our purpose. And if we're single, we messed up, right? But marriage, in reality, it's more like a side quest. Now, that's not to discredit marriage, right? Marriage, good, beautiful, has great benefits for us. But it is not the grand purpose of your life. The grand purpose of your life is to fulfill the calling God has placed on you to do good works in the kingdom of God. And so what will happen is if you let marriage become the goal of your life rather than embracing the season God has put you in right now to fulfill your purpose, then you're going to miss out on so much of the life that God has planned for you. I love a quote. Uh, it's by Jim Elliott, the famous missionary. And this is what he said about this. He said, let not our longings slay the appetite of our living. He says, look, marriage is not the goal. Right? The goal is that we fulfill our purpose to God. And so he says, look, don't let the desire of marriage become greater than your desire for God to use you in his kingdom. Don't look at singleness like it's this burden. Don't look at it like it's the thing to wait for, the next thing to come in your life, but embrace singleness as a gift from God to fulfill your purpose. Let him use the time in your life that you're in now to lead you to a growing relationship with him that leads you to bring people to the feet of Jesus. That if you can do that, Paul says, this is where the fulfillment you seek comes from. Now, the question to ask is, if singleness is a gift, right, we've established it is a gifting appropriate for the time. The question to answer then is, how is it useful to us, and what do we use it for? Well, look with me at our next verses. This is verses 25 through 31. Paul says, now about virgins, I have no command from the Lord, but I give a judgment as one by who the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. Because of the present crisis, I think that it is good for a man to remain as he is. Are you pledged to a woman? Do not seek to be released. Are you free from such a commitment? Do not look for a wife. But if you do marry, you've not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she hasn't sinned. And I love this. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life. And I want to spare you this. What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as they do not. Those who mourn as if they did not, those who are happy as if they were not, those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep, those who use the things of this world as if not engrossed in them, for this world in its present form is passing away. So Paul, as he gets to this section, he is doubling down on his opinion about marriage. If you weren't clear where Paul stood up to this point, he makes it pretty clear here. He's like, all right, are you engaged? Well, don't break it off, but if you're not married, stay out of the game, bro. And he's very clear, you need to understand the context that he writes this from. Paul says this is his opinion, not a command from God, but he also brings up a really valid point. Paul, as someone who is trustworthy of God's mercy, he says, I've got some wisdom, I've got some years under my belt at this point, maybe I'm worth listening to. And so for us, it's worth saying, okay, well, what is Paul saying and what do we gain from that? Well, Paul says that he believes that there is an advantage in being single that marriage does not have. And I love the way that Paul words this in particular. Paul says, those who will marry will face many troubles in life. And I just want to spare you from that. Now, if you're single in the room, you may be thinking, dude, those are troubles I want, right? I have troubles as a single person, so why wouldn't I just want troubles as a married person? Is that the only reason I don't have a, a ring on my finger? Is I have to navigate married life? Bring it on. But that's not the point that Paul's making. Paul is saying that there are certain freedoms in singleness that are not present in marriage. And I want you to think about this. If the purpose of our lives is truly to live out the good works that God has called us to, a distraction-free environment makes sense. And here's what Paul clarifies this 
to mean. Paul says the time is short, the days are short, that the world around us, I mean, it's on fire. Right, there are people all around us who are hurting and broken, who need to know the hope that's found in Jesus. And Paul says, hey, it's up to you to share this message with them. This is what you were called to do. It's why Paul describes, he says, look, the married should live as the unmarried do. That's not a calling from Paul to neglect your duties as a spouse. Paul says, look, man, eternity, it's right around the corner. And so the mission of making the disciples, the mission of glorifying God and leading people to Jesus, he says, this is the utmost priority for us. He says, you have to focus on the mission. But focusing on the mission, it requires an undistracted devotion to God. Because the goal is that we would grow deep in our relationship with God And in turn, we would grow in the fruit of the Spirit, and we would become effective in leading people to Jesus. And so this is what Paul says. Paul says, being single has an advantage in this area. Look at me what he says in verses 32 through 35. Paul's going to say a similar phrase. He said, I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of the world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she can please her husband. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. So Paul says, look, I want you to be free from concern. I want you to understand that singleness, it's not this burden, that if you approach it in the right way and approach it not as a burden, but as a a gift that is appropriate for the time, it is useful in leading you to growth in Jesus, right? He says there is an advantage to singleness. It's not this bad thing. But the issue is we don't really view singleness that way. Oftentimes what we do instead is we look at some different stage in life and what we like to do is we like to amplify the benefits of that other stage and we like to downplay the limitations that it has, right? And then we look at the stage of life that we're in and we do the opposite. We amplify the limitations of the stage we're in and we downplay the benefits. Does that make sense? Now, it's like this grass is always greener on the other side when it comes to marriage and singleness that we're constantly looking at the other thing and going, I bet that's better than what I got. And Paul's point here, he says, you need to understand that yes, there are limitations in singleness, but there are also limitations in marriage. And Paul says, I want you to be free from concern. He says, I want you to be free. Other ways to translate this are free of anxieties, free of the worries of marriage. Listen, every married person in this room will tell you, marriage is beautiful. But marriage has its drawbacks. There are concessions and compromises and changes and distractions that you will go through in marriage that you never would have expected. And Paul talks about this in verses 32 through 33. He starts off, he says, look, I'd like you to be free from concern because what does he say? The unmarried man, he is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he pleases the Lord. He says, the unmarried man, the only thing this dude really has to worry about in his life is to grow in his relationship with God. If he can figure that out, he's good, he's done, right? There is freedom for the unmarried man. But the married man, That poor guy. Paul says he's got all kinds of things to worry about. He says because he's not just taking care of himself anymore. He's got to take care of a whole other human. Paul says his interests are divided. So single men in the room, you might be thinking, I'd love to get married. That sounds great. Not saying it doesn't, but I want to give you a little heads up. Life changes when you get married. Right now, if you're single, let's say you have a hard day at work. 
okay? You get done with work, you're exhausted, all you want to do is come home, slam your door open, fall on the couch, veg out for eight hours. And you can do that because you're free. But the minute you're married, dude, that's game over, right? You're going to come in and you're going to fall on this couch and in will walk your beautiful wife. And she's going to ask you, how was your day? And you have to respond to her. And you can't just give her a blanket, fine, that's not going to cut it. Men, she wants details, details, details. And then when you're done sharing about your day, you're going to have to listen to her talk about her day. And you can't just listen with your ears. You have to listen with your eyes. It's all about eye contact, okay? And you don't even just get to listen, but then you have to talk back with her. And you have to say things like, well, I'd be thinking the same thing. I can't believe she said that. And you're going to have to make choices in your life that you never knew you were going to have to make. Like how many different kinds of leather couches can possibly exist? And what is a duvet cover? Why isn't it just a big blanket? Why does the blanket have a blanket? And why do I have to sell my kidney to buy it? (laughs) And women, Paul says, you're not free from this either. Verse 34 says the same thing. An unmarried woman or virgin, they are concerned about the Lord's affairs, right? She says, same deal, right? The unmarried woman, she's free. Her only concern is her relationship with God. But when you're married, you now have the concerns of the world. There is a man in your life that you get to take care of. So women, you need to know that that knight in shining armor you're planning to marry, you have to take care of that man. And I'm not talking about just in the bedroom, You're going to find out that this dude has all kinds of things that he has no clue how to do. Laundry? He doesn't know what laundry is. He knows if it passes the sniff test, it's good to go, right? And even once you get those clothes clean, folding them and putting them away, that's nonsense. There's a corner of the room for that. He's going to shove it all into a basket, and he's going to dig through it for a week like an animal. And cooking, he probably knows how to cook. It's good. He don't know how to clean up after it. So he's going to make you this wonderful meal, and then it's going to look like a bomb went off in your kitchen. And his response to that is to sweep everything into the sink and not touch it. And when it finally grows something, he just pours bleach on it and goes, I think it's food safe. Got to teach him how to live. And some of you, you're going to marry men whose hygiene levels like, aren't just poor, they're unsafe. And you're going to wonder how this man ever made it to the age that he is. You're going to have to teach him to live like a clean, normal human being. And maybe you have a stressful day at work. And all you want to do is you want to come home and talk to your husband. You want to pour your heart out to your soulmates because he's there to walk through life with you. But as you speak to him, his eyes glaze over. And instead of staring at you, he stares through you like some dumb ogre who doesn't understand what you're saying. The chances are, he doesn't. (laughs) Now, newly married or engaged people, if you're in here or listening, I can feel the tension as you slowly pull the ring off your finger. (laughs) Stop. I'm not saying that marriage is bad. Marriage, it is beautiful. It is a gift from God. There is great benefit in marriage. But marriage has its limitations and its distractions just as much as it has its benefits. And so this is what I want you to understand. If you are single, you're not in some lesser stage of life than married people. That yes, there are limitations to singleness, but there are limitations to marriage. And there are also great benefits to singleness. Paul says that you have freedom and time that we don't have as married people. And so Paul says there's a way to use this freedom and time. He says that we devote it to God. Look back at verse 35 with me. He says, I'm saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way, in undivided devotion to God. That Paul says, look, I'm, I'm not trying to trick you. I'm not trying to get you to be single so that you experience some lesser version of life. I'm not trying to keep you away from God's plan. He says that singleness serves a purpose, that if you can understand that singleness is not a burden, but approach it as a gifting appropriate for the time, Paul says it leads you to unhindered growth. Because where Married people, we have distractions, 
you have freedom. And so it's up to you to take this extra time and freedom that you have and use it in a way to grow with God. Paul says, devote it to God that leads to an undivided devotion. And so the best way that you can use the time that you have is to invest it into your relationship with God and into the kingdom of God. I have some ways I want to challenge you on this. And I want you to hear this. I'm going to speak mainly to single people, but married people, these are things we have to grow into, right? The first thing I want to say is that the best way you can spend your time that you have is to grow in your relationship with God. Take this extra time you have, man, spend it deeply diving into scripture, study and meditate on God's word and find ways to apply it to your life. This extra time that you have, man, spend it in undistracted prayer. And what a better thing to do as we lead up to Easter than to pray passionately with zero distraction to our good father. The second way that you can use your time that you can leverage this is to take bigger steps in serving. You know, one of the reasons that Paul thought that singleness was such a freedom for him was he was a missionary. It gave him freedoms to travel and do. And what I'm not telling you is that if there's not a ring on your finger to go sell all your possessions and move to like Taiwan or Japan, not saying that. But what I am saying is leverage this time that you have to be devoted to God's kingdom in serving. You can do that here at the church. I mean, we have a ton of ways you can get plugged in here or with our local missions partners. We have teams where we desperately need people to serve. And our missions partners need people to walk alongside them in the missions that they're carrying out. And so I want to challenge you today as you leave, not to just kind of brush by, like pretend like the connect booth's not there. Stop by, talk with Adam, find ways that you can get involved here because it matters. The last way that I would encourage you to use your time to grow in your relationship with God is to take up the challenge to disciple someone. Like as you're growing and maturing in your faith through time with God and through service to him, the next thing you can do is teach someone to do the same thing. Find someone in your life who you can help grow in their faith and leverage this extra time you have to meet with them, spend time with them, teach them what it looks like to follow Jesus. And look, if you want to do that, but you're saying, I don't know how to do that, come talk to me, come find Nathan, come find one of our pastors or one of our elders. We would love to help you with this and give you resources on what it looks like to disciple someone. But look, whatever it looks like for you, that's the goal, right? Is to be devoted to God with an undivided devotion. Don't let singleness be this moment in your life where all you do is pine for the future. Don't let your longings slay the appetite of your living. But look at singleness as a gifting from God that he can use to grow you in your relationship with him and to grow you in how you fulfill the purpose that he's called you to. As we close today, I want to leave you with one more Jim Elliott quote. Jim Elliott said, he said, wherever you are, be all there. Live to the hilt every situation you believe to be the will of God. Isn't that beautiful? Listen, I, I can't speak to whether your singleness is a season or whether this is what God is calling you to for the rest of your life. It's not my place. But here's what I can speak to. This doesn't have to be a season of hurt. It doesn't have to be a season of bitterness. It doesn't have to be a season of frustration and emptiness, but that this can be a season of joy. It can be a season of satisfaction and fulfillment. It can be a season of growth. And so the challenge, man, is don't waste the season you find yourself in. Don't waste your singleness. But whatever you find yourself in to be the will of God, live to the hilt wherever you are. Be all there. Don't look at singleness or marriage or whatever season you're in as this burden on your life, but look at it as a gifting appropriate for the time that God will use it to do unimaginable things in you and through you. And so that's the challenge. Embrace the season you're in, 
devote yourself to God in that season and let him grow you in your relationship with him and to live out the purpose he's called you to. And if you can do that, you will be blown away by the joy and the fulfillment and the purpose that you will find in your life. Let's pray.